Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? The human voyage through time is an infinite quest for order among chaos. Man's eye has always been caught by shape and pattern. Man's nature urges him to perceive, to comprehend, and to predict the nature of all creation. Now the quest into the infinite has revealed an underlying structure in matter to help explain the universe. From the smallest molecule to the most distant star. Throughout human history, whatever shape the eye perceived, the hand has tried to recreate. What blueprints does nature follow? What shapes a snowflake? How is matter organized to be alive? These are questions of the significance of shape and structure. Searching for form and pattern has extended our horizons and given us new ways of seeing ourselves. Twenty thousand years ago, the primitive eye perceived regularity in the human form. The same rigid proportions from Russia, France, Italy and Austria. A Stone Age Venus with a symmetry roughly patterned on circles and triangles. The ancient Greeks invented the study of geometric forms but let the human figure relax into graceful, natural curves. Renaissance man tried to fit precise human proportions into the perfect symmetry of circle and square. Modern man explored human geometry in his way, through art, and science. If we start with a human being, you see that a human being is characterized by a very definite shape. Well, that shape is itself a reflection of the shape and constitution of the cells that make up a person. The cells, in turn, are comprised of billions of bits of, of matter which we call molecules. And the shape of these molecules is of fundamental importance for the functioning of any living cell. That was the key to an understanding of matter. There are certain basic shapes in its organization. The properties of an object are related to the shapes of its parts and the pattern of its structure, whether it's put together by nature or by man. The 
geodesic dome, light, inexpensive, and strong. Spiders build by instinct. Man must learn to be an engineer, to take advantage of available materials and of their properties, to use objects of one shape to form a structure of another. For most of our history, we simply borrowed shapes from nature without understanding their significance. One was the sphere. To the ancient Greeks, it was perfection. To us, it can be economy, architectural strength, or natural beauty. Some forms have surfaces bounded by three sides. A fish is streamlined as a series of triangles. There is strength in the beak of a bird, ability to penetrate in a spearhead. But what hidden structure forms carbon into a diamond, one of the hardest crystals known? Science has revealed that we not only copy natural shapes, we build, as nature does, by assembling units in an orderly arrangement. Ancient cultures arranged stone blocks to form the pyramidal symmetry of their monuments. Just as nature arranges atoms to form a pyramidal crystal. There is a symmetrical structure based on four-sided shapes. Cubic crystals of salt could serve as a model for our own building structures. Four-sided symmetry still dominates most architecture, from habitat to Indian cliff dwellings. We cannot see the atomic structure of a salt crystal, but it is just as real and just as important as the structural framework of our buildings. There are structures based on six-sided symmetry and hexagonal shapes. The honeycomb design is used in art, and the same design combines strength with economy of material in a beehive. There are even hexagonal molecules, such as the benzene ring, and from molecular structure come specific properties. Water is a liquid because of the shape of the water molecule one atom of oxygen with two atoms of hydrogen, bonded at a particular angle. If the molecule were not bent like this, this vital fluid might be a gas, and life on Earth would not be as we know it. These liquids each have a different viscosity. How much each one resists flow depends on how its molecules are put together. If sugar cubes represent the atoms in each molecule, we can see that for some substances, molecules made up of many atoms form thick liquids. Those made of only a few form thinner, less viscous liquids.
These bubbles represent molecules. They show that rows of identical units can form a pattern that gives regularity, symmetry, to structure. In one of many possible patterns, each unit touches six others around it. Then there is a six-sided hexagonal arrangement to the structure. Adding a third dimension to this pattern can produce the structure of a crystal, a highly organized form of solid matter. When water crystallizes to form ice, the liquid's random arrangement of molecules becomes more orderly. Partly because of their shape, water molecules join together in hexagonal patterns. If water freezes as it's falling through air containing other water molecules, crystals grow to form the six-sided beauty of snowflakes. Molecular shape tells us why snow crystals have six arms, but we still don't know how all six arms of a single flake incorporate molecules in the same structural pattern. One way to grow crystals is to drop a small crystal into a solution that's so heavily saturated with some substance that it's on the verge of crystallization. The addition of more solids triggers the process. Molecules of the substance are taken from solution and added to a shower of growing crystals. A substance may be identified partly by the shape of its crystals. Common salt sodium chloride has atoms of sodium and chlorine packed together to form a symmetrical cube. Alums form octahedral crystals. The three-dimensional regularity of building blocks within a crystal produces certain properties such as giving the crystal a grain. Cutting along the grain produces a sharp, even break as rows of units simply split apart. There may be several planes along which the crystal can be cleaved evenly. But if you try to cut at an angle to the grain, you will disrupt the ordered arrangement of building blocks, and the crystal may shatter or crumple. Working out the details of crystalline structure was not easy. Atoms and molecules are too small to be seen, even through a microscope. However, their shape and their arrangement can sometimes be detected indirectly. Light can be scattered into a pattern that suggests the shape of the object it is passing through. In the same way, X-rays passing through a crystal will be scattered or diffracted by the crystal's building blocks. The diffraction pattern reveals to the expert eye a structural pattern within the crystal. A diamond cutter must understand the structure of the crystal he is working with. He must study it, determine its grain, and cut only along built-in cleavage planes. What makes a diamond so hard is the nature of its internal structure. Carbon atoms form a tetrahedral latticework, with each atom firmly bonded to four others for a strong, rigid structure.
The properties of metals also depend on crystalline structure. Metallic crystals have faults in their atomic grid. Pressure can shift groups of units, making metals malleable. The finer the crystals, the harder the metal. Movements stop at crystal boundaries. Iron can be hardened with the addition of carbon to form the tough iron-carbon alloy known as steel. The larger carbon atoms block the traffic of shifting iron atoms to produce resistance to pressure. Heating metals loosens the bonds that hold the building blocks of their crystals in place. That makes hot metal easier to shape than cold. An understanding of how crystals are formed and how their structure affects their properties has helped us to engineer materials to design them for specific uses. But there is much to learn in the incredible realm of crystals. This is a crystalline arrangement, but not an ordinary crystal. It's a virus, a class of organism that can only reproduce by invading a living cell, a fascinating form of life. If we actually look at the structure of certain viruses that infect cells, we find that they have an incredible resemblance to the lunar landing module. And uh, if you compare them, you see that indeed there are many analogies. A virus is little more than a package of DNA, which is the chemical basis of heredity. Its molecular structure was worked out while man was preparing to travel to the moon. The master molecule of all living organisms, of all living systems, is really the genetic blueprint, or the DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. You see, there are two parts to the DNA molecule. There are two long strands that run parallel to each other. And what gives the molecule its specificity, the storage of information, are these structures that called bases that fit between the two strands, like your your hands in a glove. They are complementary. They fit into each other in a very precise way. And that's what gives them their specificity. The chemical makeup of the crossbars that hold the molecule's two strands together determine the identity of any individual. This is what makes one a man, a mouse, or a mulberry tree. A copy of this chemical blueprint exists in the chromosomes of every living cell. When a cell divides, the DNA first doubles and then divides as well. The two daughter cells are then genetically identical to be part of a specific individual. Now that we've begun to understand how genetic information is chemically coded in the DNA molecule, what next?
Should we use our chemical expertise to change details in the structure of that giant molecule? We might then be able to control the genetic makeup of the plants and animals we breed. A certain level of genetic engineering is already possible. But should it ever be practiced on man? Some questions are easier to answer. What is the definition of identical? Twins are usually close to identical if they share the same genetic makeup. Two hands may look identical, but one is actually the mirror image of the other. One is right and one is left. And the concept of right and left-handedness extends right down to molecular structure. Two molecules shaped like this might seem to be identical molecules of the same substance, but one is the mirror image of the other. One is called right-handed and one left. It can make a difference in taste. A molecule must fit exactly into a tiny pit in the sensory cells of the tongue in order to produce a taste of its substance. If it doesn't, if the arrangement of its branches is wrong, the molecule may produce a different taste, or no taste at all. The chemistry of right and left-handed molecules is vital to life. On Earth, living tissues produce and depend on mostly right-handed molecules. Alice might have starved in her looking-glass world. Vital substances there might well have had left-handed molecules that her body could not digest. Smell is another sense that may depend largely on molecular shape. In insects, olfactory organs are located on the antennae. An odor is perceived when nerve cells are stimulated by airborne molecules. A male moth can respond to the stimulus of a single molecule and can find a mate by following a chemical trail coming from a female of his species. When we perceive the fragrance of flowers, we are responding to the presence of a particular substance with a particular molecular shape. It's been suggested that there are seven basic odors based on seven shapes of molecules. This is what a molecule of a substance with a floral scent might look like. It corresponds with the shape of a receptor pit in the sensory cells of the nose. An exact fit may trigger a nerve impulse that the brain interprets as the scent of flowers. The electron microscope is one of the sophisticated tools for studying the shape and arrangement of molecules. A specimen to be viewed is first given a coating of gold. Then it is bombarded with electrons. Here, electrons are being reflected, like light, from the surface of a butterfly wing. They produce a pattern that the microscope makes visible to reveal more and more details of structure. By bombarding matter with various forms of energy, it is possible to produce patterns that reveal molecular structure and to achieve the equivalent of magnifications far beyond the powers of any microscope. An elaborate device called a spectroscope reveals how different substances affect light. It analyzes chemicals by acting as a detector of light from specific atoms and molecules.
Canadian Nobel Prize winner Gerhard Herzberg uses the spectroscope to study the structure of the building blocks of matter. Each atom or molecule has a characteristic spectrum of its own. You know that from the case of the sodium atom. If you put a bit of salt into a flame, you see this very characteristic yellow color, which is produced by two very close lying yellow spectral lines. And conversely, the presence of these atoms can be detected in various materials by studying the spectrum. In the case of molecules, you have thousands of lines uh, that are characteristic for each molecule. And in order to study them, we need, therefore, instruments of high resolving power. Now we can build new molecules to create synthetic materials with specific properties. Nylon copies the long chain protein molecule of silk. We can vary the elasticity of synthetic rubbers with folded flexible molecules that differ in how well they return to their original shape. One class of synthetic molecules, plastics. The molding process itself may form crosslinks between atoms so that some useful plastic object may be one gigantic molecule. Plastic can even be used to make replacement parts for the human body. An artificial heart valve works because its molecules are the right shape. They produce smoothness, strength, and compatibility with human tissues. As research goes on, the frontiers of knowledge about the structure of matter continue to expand. Each atom has a very characteristic spectrum, and therefore we can detect atoms also in bodies that are very far away from us, like stars, the sun, and so on. And this has been done. But now the question comes, what about the space between the stars? And the last uh, 10 years or so have yielded a very large number of molecules in interstellar space, a total of about 26 different molecules have been determined. Our boundless curiosity pursues knowledge into the infinite. We reach out to the incomprehensible distances of outer space and into the unseen sub-microscopic realm of inner space. If we can produce new substances and perhaps even new species of life, we wonder where will the quest for order lead and how far should we go?